Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for attending AeroDev. My name is Nick Smith. I am the uh, Director of Corporate Partnership at SME. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker and first speaker today uh, for the Smart Manufacturing Hub, Mr. David McPhail. He is the CEO of Memex. SME Smart Manufacturing Magazine recognizes Dave is one of the top 30 manufacturing visionaries. He serves on the editorial board of Manufacturing Automation Magazine and has chaired several working groups of the MT Connect Institute. His company, Memex, is a global leader in industrial Internet of Things centered on measuring manufacturing excellence. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dave McPhail. Thanks, Nick. I'll try to live up to the reputation today. Uh, if I could just get my uh, slide deck on the, uh, on the monitor, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so as Nick said, uh, I'm the president and CEO of Memex. Uh, we have a booth here. It's over in the 400 section, booth 459. I won't make this a product pitch or a commercial for our, our products or our technology, uh, but I do invite you to go and speak to our sales staff. Uh, capable sales staff over at uh, booth 459. Uh, they'll be able to answer any questions or give you a demo if you're so interested. So let's get started then. So the title today is Data Driven Manufacturing, the Foundation for Sustainable Continuous Improvement. Here's a uh, little bit of an agenda we're going to go through. I'll try to leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions, if anybody has any questions. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about IoT, uh, IoT and Industry 4.0, what all the fuss is about. We'll move on to data sources required. Uh, we'll talk about five easy steps to, um, to a successful implementation of data-driven manufacturing. We'll talk about impactful continuous improvement, IT versus OT, and the convergence that's required in order to make this, uh, this type of technology work in a manufacturing environment. We'll talk about OE and some associated benefits. We'll move on to examples of results achieved, and again, summary and some Q&A at the end. So what's uh, IoT, IoT, and, and Industry 4.0, and what's all the fuss about? Well, it's, uh, you know, there's a stat on every, any given day in any newspaper you care to read about the power of IoT or IoT or Industry 4.0 in, uh, in manufacturing, but I, I like this one the best of all the ones that I've read because it really speaks to uh, two-thirds of the GD global GDP will be affected by this technology, but it also has a caveat at the end. And basically, the caveat says there's no guarantee that this will actually work. It has to be done in an effective and, and credible and sustainable way. So um, that's an important stat. We'll do a little bit about Industry 4.0 here. Uh, this was coined by the German government back in 2010. I wasn't around for the first and second industrial uh, revolution, but I was born around the time the third started. And I've been uh, successful, uh, successfully uh, allowed to help build the fourth industrial revolution with Memex over the last decade or so, uh, and uh, and beyond. So we're just at the what I call the infantile stage of the adoption of Industry 4.0 uh, in manufacturing. We look at IIoT for a minute. Um, manufacturers are probably it's probably about 95% of manufacturers out there today don't uh, don't take advantage of this technology presently in their manufacturing operations. Um, the, uh, so essentially what IoT and manufacturing looks like is we collect three different data streams. We take data from the equipment, which is, you'll find out through this presentation, is going to be a theme I'll keep going back to because it's extremely important. Uh, we take data to and from the ERP system, and then we leverage the human capital that operate the equipment. And I'll have a slide later on that talks about the confluence of these three data streams and why they're extremely important to fuel IoT and manufacturing. Uh, some examples of IoT and manufacturing that, that we've seen or that we, uh, we presently do at Memex, uh, OEE metrics, uh, OSHA work envelope compliance, RFID, uh, energy consumption and the cost of energy consumption and how it relates to the cost of the product. These are all pragmatic business use cases. These are by no means the only business use cases. There are hundreds of business use cases that have either been identified or yet to be identified where this technology can actually truly impact the performance of manufacturing operations on a global scale. We look at the connected manufacturing evolution slash revolution and where we are today. I mean, the internet was around in 2000-ish and we've become addicted to it. I know, I don't know, I think with my exception of my 88-year-old dad, I don't know anybody that doesn't own a cell phone, uh, that doesn't use that cell phone every single day or every minute of every day, uh, sometimes to the, 
to, uh, you know, sometimes you just want to lock it up in a drawer. But anyway, uh, where we are right now is we're at the connected manufacturing uh, model where everything that run, everything that's pre-produced or everything that's producing anything is being actually connected to manufacturing's uh, management information systems. Uh, so we're at this kind of inflection point where uh, the connected uh, manufacturing model is going to become extremely important. And I, we really call it a technological shift. We look at the, the combination of these. I get asked this question a lot uh, by senior executives. How do I, I've been told I have to do something with IoT or IoT or Industry 4.0. I don't know what to do. How, where do I get started? How do I do this? My, my board's telling me, my shareholders are telling me, whatever. My operational management team is telling me I have to do something, but I don't understand how do I apply this tech, technology. So I want to try and kind of bridge the gap between these three ideas into one common thread here. So we, as we talked about IoT, was MIT coined this term in 1999, so you know, it's been around the better part of two decades at this point. Uh, Industry 4.0, as we said earlier, was the German government in 2010. And then I tried to find a stat on IoT, and Cisco and GE compete for who came up with this term first, and one says they did it in 2006, the other one said 2007. Anyway, suffice to say, these, uh, the term's been around for probably close to a decade and a half at this, at this juncture. But I want you to think about a convergence of, convergence of these three technologies into one common idea, where we have consolidated reporting, big data and analytics, corporate dashboards, all driven by real-time data. We call this concept, and we didn't coin this term, I believe the first time I read it was in Modern Machine Shop, was data-driven manufacturing. And it's interesting how when you start to talk about the concept of data-driven manufacturing over top of some more nebulous terms like IoT, IoT, or Industry 4.0, how that starts to resonate with operational management teams. We look at data-driven manufacturing uh, and how it's reality versus myth and how it's applied today. Uh, we'll start with the myths first. So a uh, theoretical construct with no practical application, that's a myth. Or an unquantified capital expenditure with no known return on investment, another myth. Uh, highly technical deployment strategy, another myth. Uh, and the one at the, the end here is the one I like the best. It's also not a magic bullet for every single problem that manufacturers face today. So let's talk about reality and what, what, it, what it means to manufacturing. So it's both disruptive and transformative in a good way. Uh, it's a known and quantifiable payback, and we'll, we'll get to that later uh, with real numbers. Uh, it's practical and proven to be of major use in eradicating productivity gaps. Uh, it's generating, on average, a 300% internal return rate of capital or a four-month payback, and uh, it's available today. So again, not a theoretical construct. It's a practical business use case. It's being solved today with technology. Uh, we look at the data streams required to fuel an IoT implementation. So the drive towards connectivity, this will be the second time I mention this, connectivity is probably the most important of the three data streams because if we don't have the data from the equipment that makes the products that we manufacture, we really just have opinion, we don't have fact. So we don't have the actual understanding of exactly what goes on, how that equipment is being utilized. Most machine tool manufacturers will tell you that their equipment has a 98.5 or 99.2% uptime capability. Uh, but most of the equipment that we see you being utilized today is a sub 40%. So that delta, that approximately 50 plus percent, is usually contained in areas that we're not tracking. We're not looking at uh, whether there's no tooling or no dunnage or setups are taking longer or those types of things. Equipment's capable of running from a maintenance perspective or a, a, a serviceability perspective, but it just doesn't run because we're not utilizing it effectively. Uh, some of the drivers include higher customer satisfaction, lower costs, competitive agility, and obviously greater productivity. I put through the next two slides in because one of the questions I get asked often is, well, I, I understand how we can connect to our newer machines and, and our OPC capable machines and other types of electronic protocols where an Ethernet jack exists, but how do I connect to all the legacy assets that I currently have? And so I threw this slide in because this is one example of connectivity. It just happens to be our product, but it's one example of a small little electronic device that essentially turns the machine into a web server. And so now we're capable of taking that data out and using it uh, in, in a multitude of different business use cases. And I would, uh, don't trust me on this one. Take a look at the pictures. These are older machines. One of them is a Fennec 18T. Another one's a Tosnak 888. Uh, and the third one, I believe, is a Yasnak uh, MX or, or I-80, I believe. These are older equipment. Uh, the data set is not as rich as we would get from an MT Connect or a Fennec Focus or an OPC-laden machine, but it's still very valuable in the, in the quest for data-driven manufacturing. 
We look at the confluence of three data streams again. We look at operator data, as we said. We looked at business systems data or ERP data. In other words, the production schedule and the product standards associated with the parts that are being produced. And we look at arguably the foundation for the, all of this and the most important piece is the actual machine data. And we don't have those uh, pieces of data and we're just reliant on operator data and we have an ERP system, we're getting latent uh, metrics, we're getting inaccurate data and we're making bad decisions as a result. When we tie these three data streams together, we can get really proactive with how we manage our manufacturing operations. When we look at data-driven manufacturing and how it comes alive, well, obviously it starts with evidence-based real-time data. We have to have that. It's foundational. Uh, we can get a little more elegant by tying it into our ERP system to drive things like inventory and procurement directly uh, without the need of manual data input. If we want to get more elegant yet, we can add work in, uh, RFID on work in progress or high value tooling or fixturing uh, so we know where that is around the plant and we can dispatch material handling uh, personnel or, or resources, you know, whether it's cranes or forklifts or, or whatever, to be able to take that material and move it to the next operation. We can do it in advance so we're not actually sitting around having the machine wait while the material is being conveyed. Uh, uh, the whole purpose of all of this is to drive costs out of the enterprise and increase profitability. Uh, productivity and profitability are intrinsically linked to each other. If we increase our productivity, we'll ultimately increase our profitability and we'll do more with the same level of effort. Uh, the, the journey on continuous improvement, which I'll get into uh, two sections from now, is a, is a circle, not a straight line. And when we do this, we actually get horizontal and vertical integration. So we get shop floor to top floor connectivity. We also get every single part of our operational management team working with one data set as a, with a common goal to increase the productivity of the factory, which ultimately increases the profitability. So we talk about five easy steps to successfully implementing data-driven manufacturing. It's like a staircase. Number one, the first step is con connect. The second one is visualize. Third one is analyze. Fourth one is optimize. And ultimately, the whole reason for doing a project like this would be how to monetize it. How do we get our return investment back? And how do we have that technology continue to repay us year after year after year. So we'll go into each one of those in a little bit of detail here. So when we talk about Connect, we're talking about, as I said, MT Connect capable machines or FANUC Focus capable machines or OPC machines. Those are relatively what I call plug and play. Uh, they account for probably 30 to 35 percent uh, right now of, of machines that are in use uh, across uh, globally, uh, specifically here in North America, probably closer to 40 percent. We have a whole uh, litany of manufacturing equipment that was done in a different time. It was uh, predates Ethernet, so it doesn't actually have the ability to speak intelligently or it speaks some serial-based proprietary protocol. So uh, we had installed a hardware adapter to turn that machine into a web server and essentially have it speak intelligently. And uh, then we take data from the human capital and we take data to and from ERP. So this is really the networking piece or the connection piece as the first step. We have that piece, we can now visualize the data. So we do and on screens throughout the factory, so we actually have uh, manufacturing personnel that are actually on the shop floor, understanding how their, their behavior impacts productivity and ultimately profitability. Uh, we have obviously a server, it can be cloud-based or, or on-prem depending on your security requirements. Uh, and then we have web-based intuitive dashboarding, so we actually have reports and dashboards and things of that nature that actually give the operational management team a completely different situational awareness tool than what they presently have. The third step in this journey is to analyze the data. So when we, we have this great data stream now, we want to analyze it by machine, by work cell, by shift, or by product. We want to identify some trends, whether it was the current shift, the last shift, the last week, the last month, uh, or whatever period to date, 30 days or whatever. And then we want to run production reports. And these production reports become the foundation of what I call impactful continuous improvement, which we'll get into next. Because if we have non-impactful continuous improvement, we're, we're basically guessing at what our triage is going to be. And as we know, there's three things that change in any company. There's people, there's product, and there's equipment. Anytime any one of those three variables change, our productivity suffers. The fourth step is optimize. So we want to be able to Again, use an, a, a pragmatic approach driven by real-time data. And I have an example of a, of a Kaizen event in our next section here that will hopefully speak to that. But we bucket the time into five different categories. We bucket into machine effectiveness, 
jo shop effectiveness, job effectiveness, maintenance effectiveness, and system effectiveness. And then the fifth step and arguably the most important for the person who's going to sign the check to, to implement this type of solution is how do we monetize it? Well, how do we impact our productivity? As I told you earlier, payback is on average 300% or a four month payback. It's a 20% uh, profit increase can generate, sorry, a 20% productivity increase can generate a, approximately a 60% profit increase for the same level of effort. So the numbers are extremely compelling and they're all quantifiable, there's no new math or, or different math here, this is all simple math as we'll get into in a minute. We'll look at impactful continuous improvement for a minute. So these are some of the goals uh, of continuous improvement. Again, as I said, it's a circle, not a straight line where things, there's constantly in, a bunch of things in flux in the average manufacturing uh, facility. So we obviously want to get to better root cause analysis, we want to improve our on-time delivery so we can take on more, more orders from, uh, from our customers. We want to measurably improve our profitability. We want to uh, improve our uptime. What do we want to reduce through our continuous improvement journeys? Well, we obviously want to identify bottlenecks faster. The faster we identify them, the faster we can fix them. The, pro the productivity increases, profitability increases. We want to obviously reduce unplanned downtime. That's bad. Uh, reduce setup time and changeover times are important. We want to minimize unproductive labor. Eliminate manual data entry because it's subjective and usually late, uh, latent. And we obviously want to reduce the cost of waste. When we look at our traditional seven step Kaizen event that probably a lot of people in this uh, audience have done in the past. What's the first step we do? Well, we, we go down, we collect some data. Uh, we determine some root cause. We aggregate that data. We then come uh, develop a countermeasure. We then implement that, hypothesize a solution and we decide we're going to try it out. So then we test our hypothesis, we collect some more data, and if it was accretive, or in some cases neutral, we'll actually add it to standard work. And then we repeat that process over and over again. And as we, as I said earlier, there's three things that are constantly in flux, people, product, and, and equipment. So it's a never-ending uh, uh, process. What about if we could take, uh, and, and so uh, let me just get here, so time wasted collecting and aggregating data is really the key here. We look at a, a revised Kaizen approach with with real-time data, when we have the actual data at our fingertips and we can run reports and look for trends, we're now taking two steps out of that process. So we're continuously looking for opportunities where we can monetize uh, non-productive time or setup time or maintenance or whatever the constraint is. Uh, so we run a report, we determine the root cause, we hypothesize the solution, uh, we implement it, we run another report, see whether it was accretive or neutral, we implement the solution and we make it standard work. We have a much faster cycle here of Kaizen improvements that we can do if we have all of the data to support the hypothesis and all the data to support whether the, the change that we made was, uh, was beneficial or not. So the emphasis shifts to, shifts to the value added activities only. The non-value added activities like tracking data simply just go away. So some of the benefits of impactful continuous improvement, well, we're, we're going to have better quality, we're going to reduce our setup time, we're going to produce our non-productive labor, uh, we're going to uh, automatically report on a daily basis so we actually have trends we can look at, we can see how we did. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have alerts so we'll have proactive information about things when they're offside or when they're substandard so we can actually send the team down to the floor or the Gemba uh, in the Japanese uh, lean manufacturing technology uh, or terminology and we can actually fix it in real time. So we really have a chance here to see a trend in the morning, fix it in the afternoon, and by the, and by the end of the day, run a report and actually see that we kind of righted the ship from, uh, from where we were when we started. And then a concept that we brought uh, to the market a couple years ago was called support the internal customer. And it's been proven if we can bring the operator every single thing that the operator needs to be more productive, guess what? He'll be more productive. Because we won't have to look for tooling or dunnage or material handling equipment. If we can give the operator the ability to be part of a solution rather than just simply pointing out that there's a problem, uh, our productivity increases uh, dramatically in some cases. Uh, this is an example of a Gemba board with driven by real-time data. We actually have customers that will do this electronically. So the Gemba, they don't print out any paper. It's actually just done by, uh, by uh, electronic. It just scrolls through different reports on the, on the end of a shift. Uh, that's where all the operational management team meets on the shop floor uh, to review the previous shift and what the goals are for the current shift. Uh, here's a quick example here of a 30, 30, let's just pick 30 machines. 
So we've got 30 machines five days a week, 16 hours a day. Our loaded labor cost is $85, which is probably low in aerospace. Uh, we've got 30 machines for cost for the purposes of costing a project. We've got 30 machines connected, but 15 of them require that hardware device I mentioned earlier. We're going to focus on a really small incremental delta here. We're going to focus on three minutes for reducing downtime and increasing our productivity by two minutes per hour per machine for increased visibility. It's been our experience that you'll get six to ten percent by just having and on screens and not running a single report. Because you'll actually give the operational management team, the, specifically the people on the floor, the ability to see how their behavior impacts performance. We look at, uh, so this translates to approximately an eight percent increase in OEE, so a relatively conservative number. When we look at what that did uh, to this particular uh, shop, we're looking at uh, five minutes per machine per hour that we saved, uh, 40 hours per machine per week, or sorry, per shift per, uh, per, shift per day. Uh, we're looking at about $150,000 spend, but we're giving back $850,000 of, of money to the bottom line and, and uh, essentially net profit. Uh, our return, return rate is greater than 400%, but over a three-year period, we would have returned $850,000 to the balance sheet. This is a very typical customer that implements this type of technology. This isn't a, an outlier or a corner case. Uh, this is very typical, very average. IT versus OT convergence is coming. And this is an important piece because one of the biggest complaints that I get, or our sales team gets, is through this adoption of this technology is IT won't let me do it. And I think that just comes from a misunderstanding of exactly how this gets done. Uh, it doesn't, the, the worst thing you can do is go to Best Buy and buy a D-Link wireless router or a router and then plug everything in on the factory floor. Really what you want to do is get IT involved at the beginning and work through the process to be able to collect the data uh, in, a in a sustainable way but also a safe way so that we're not actually compromising or exposing our factory floor to any malware viruses or, or, or bad, uh, bad intentions on the part of other people. So some, there's two definitions there of IT and OT. I'm not going to read them uh, because this is being recorded, but essentially Gardner, I think, put the, the, hit the nail on the head when they identified what IT is concerned about and what OT is concerned about, or operational technology people. Uh, and it's been our experience that there's this huge wall in between the two uh, that needs to be broken down. So we look at a typical implementation of this type of technology. Everywhere in red is what IT cares about. So they care about the server, the networks, the database. Uh, everything in green is what OT cares about. They care about the applications. They care about the, uh, the ability to take the data. Um, that's what they care about because ultimately they're going to use this data and transform their business. So you can see there's a tremendous amount of overlap here. One has to work with the other for this to be successful. Because you can't just have the stuff in green without the stuff in red. So uh, we, we've been advocating for a long time that there, there must be a convergence between IT and OT so that they're on the same page, so this is done in a sustainable way, that it's done in a secure way that doesn't leave uh, a lot of opportunity for bad, bad, pe bad people with bad intentions, you know, hackers or malware or viruses or things of that nature. Uh, we've seen it go the other way. We've seen it where people haven't taken that approach and we have seen some, unfortunately, seen some bad things happen. So this is extremely important that IT and OT work together. Uh, otherwise, these projects don't always work out the way they intended. Uh, so some areas to explore. Which one am I doing for time? I'm pretty good. Uh, so rising business costs, reducing operating costs. These are all things that, that our customers tell us are critical business challenges for them in this current environment. Uh, data collection ac ac accuracy, continuous improvement initiatives like TPM, Lean, uh, Hoshin Canary, uh, uh, Kaizen events like I talked about earlier, and obviously nobody wants to make a whole bucket full of bad parts. So what does OEE matter in the uh, IoT era or IoT era? Well, it's one of the most important metrics in manufacturing. 85% uh, OEE is world class. Most customers that we see that start on this journey are sub 40%. It's usually around 35 is where the number starts. The good news is we have seen many customers get to 75, 80, 85 percent sustainable OEE. Uh, so that's important because in order for that to happen, if you started at 35 or 40 percent, there's an entire cultural shift that happens within the company where the data is the arbitrar of the decision, that everybody's working with the same data set with one goal in mind, increase the productivity of the company. So availability times quality times performance uh, is OEE. Availability is runtime divided by downtime. 
uh, run, run time plus downtime, never be more than 100%. Quality is a simple one too. It's, it's uh, good parts divided by total parts, including scrap. And then performance is the standard that you said the part to part time should be versus what it actually is without any inclusion of downtime. These three numbers multiplied by each other represent an OEE metric. As I said earlier, it's uh, fast becoming the gold standard in manufacturing efficiency. Uh, what drives the desire for OE? Well, obviously, we're replacing manual subjective data collection with objective real time data collection. We're revealing hidden factories. We're lighting up dark assets. Uh, and it, it's the opportunity to take lean manufacturing to the next level because we're actually using real data to, uh, to make our decisions or base our decisions on. Factory on the left is usually the typical factory that we start with. Uh, there's a bunch of micro stops, uh, whether it's maintenance or setup or downtime, speed loss. Uh, the factory on the right uh, is, the, is the goal. It's the, we want the desired state to be 85% where we're, we've taken all of that non-productive time and converted it to productive time. Uh, this doesn't happen with one, I would love to tell you that there's just one area in every factory that we go to and that's where we start, and, but it's, it's not. It's, it's a small incremental step across mul a multitude of, you know, whether it's operator productivity increases or minimizing rejects, reducing downtime. All of these little small little steps actually add up to a really big number, in, some, in most cases between 10 and 50 percent, in some cases higher. So it really is a, a bunch of small little incremental steps along the journey. There's no one magic bullet that solves everybody's problem. It just depends on the product you make and the equipment you use to make it. Uh, some of the success that we've had in precision machining or aerospace, all the numbers are here, large equipment manufacturer, specialty machining. So this, the, the whole purpose of this slide is just to say that this doesn't apply to one genre of manufacturing in isolation of another. This actually applies to pretty much any company making anything. We've done a lot of work in food and beverage packaging, which I know has absolutely nothing to do with everybody here today, but they have the same challenges that you do. Trying to get more productivity out of their equipment with the same, and people with the same level of effort. Here's another example, some more benefits, uh, you know, 100, 100 plus hours, whoops, I went too far. Uh, Uh, Forty-two percent boost, cost savings. Like these are again, this is being recorded, so I'm not going to read these stats. But this is—I don't know what your reality will be if you go down this journey, and I hope you do. But it's probably somewhere in these numbers. From a summary perspective, this is being applied successfully today. Uh, why wait? Uh, approximately 300 percent internal return rate of capital. Benefits are extremely compelling. Uh, the why should always be the first discussion. We should talk about the why first. I didn't put that slide in here, but, but the why is important. In other words, what's the intended business outcome? Because if we don't have that well understood, chances are projects like this don't get properly financed by, by uh, CFOs or, or the financial people within the company. Uh, security has to be part of the discussion. We can't just do this in an ad hoc manner or we're exposing ourselves to bad things from bad people. And with that, I'm finished. I think I left uh, approximately eight minutes for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. No questions? Yes. I, uh, normally we have a mic roaming around, Roger. Do we have a mic roaming around? Yeah, sure. We got one right here, Dave. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here just wanted me to go back to the OE slide. There you go. Don't be shy. Roger's got the mic. If anybody has questions for Dave, please just raise your hand. I can run the mic over to you. Here we go. Yeah. This is uh, Ravi here from Infosys. Thanks a lot for that uh, wonderful insight. It's very useful. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the work that you have done for the CPG industry um, in terms of improving the OEE and things like that. Okay. So what kind of uh, drastic differences that you have seen uh, in the CPG and the aerospace manufacturing shop floor? Can you show some light on that? Well, as I said earlier, there, like, we've done work in metal fabrication. We've done work in aerospace. We started in aerospace. Probably, I'd still today say 60 plus percent of our customers are in the aerospace industry. Uh, we started in aerospace. Our launch customer was in 2009. 
very expensive equipment, very expensive labor costs. So, I mean, probably the highest unit labor cost or, you know, a dollar per hour labor cost of any industry that I'm aware of. Uh, equipment's also very expensive. Tolerances are usually very tight. So scrap is a problem. Uh, whereas in, in uh, food and beverage packaging, it's more along the lines of trying to get uh, USDA compliance and, and being able to deliver product on time at, with the right temperature or with the right whatever the specifications are of the product that they're making. Uh, but also, in most cases, also very expensive equipment. Labor's not so expensive, but the actual equipment itself is very expensive. And when it's down, it's a tremendous amount of cost per hour for that equipment to be down. So it really doesn't translate into the labor cost per se, but the actual equipment cost is horrendously expensive in food and beverage packaging. Our, it's, de it's dedicated equipment. It doesn't. It usually makes one or two styles of, of whatever it is, and they have another line that makes one or two styles of that. It's not can't can't make anything from a you know a wing spar to a to a piece of for a landing gear on the same piece of machinery. Any other questions for Dave? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dave.